Welcome to today's program titled the Biden administration actions on labor and employment in the first 100 days. At this time, all participants are in a listen only mode. For those of you who are logged into the web presentation, you are encouraged to submit questions throughout the conference by typing them into the Q and a box on the right hand side of your screen. For those interested in obtaining CLE credit for this webinar, an attendance verification code will be read during the presentation that will be required on the CLE attendance affirmation form. Please write this code down as it will not be reread and is required for CLE credit. Copies of the webinar recording and materials along with the CLE attendance form will be distributed to attendees in the days following the webinar. On the next slide, you will see a legal disclaimer. At this time, I would like to turn it over to our first speaker, Leon Rodriguez. Leon, please go ahead. Uh, good afternoon, uh, everybody. Uh, thank you uh, for joining us today for our 100 days update on the Biden administration. Uh, they, they frequently say that the first 100 days uh, in a presidential administration are, are particularly critical for setting uh, the direction of the next four years. Whether that's true in this administration or not remains to be seen. Uh, but we do know two things, uh, and that is that in the world of labor and employment, uh, there have really been two headlines. Uh, the first is COVID, and the second is labor and unions. Uh, and we have a perfect uh, panel uh, this afternoon to talk about those two things uh, with you, uh, and also to give you a general guided tour of how the Biden administration is placing its stamp on the world of labor and employment. Uh, today, I'm joined by Tracy Billows, a partner in our Chicago office, uh, my Washington, D.C. colleague, Scott Hecker, uh, Kylan Kurt, uh, Kershaw, uh, a partner in the Atlanta office, and finally, Scott Mallory, uh, counsel in Sacramento. And actually, Scott's going to be leading us off, uh, telling us a bit about uh, some of the new folks that we're seeing uh, at the Department of Labor and elsewhere within the new administration. Scott, all yours. Hello, everyone. I'm Scott Mallory. Uh, the, the, there have been a lot of changes happening at the DOL, and I think that the DOL is, is going to be a key agency in the Biden administration, especially when it comes to, as Leon recently said, the one of the main folk guys of this specific administration being unionization. Uh, next slide, please. So, speaking of unionization, we'll, of course, start with the head of the department, uh, Secretary Marty Walsh. Um, it, for those who have been following us, following this administration, you might have seen this slide before since he was nominated about January 7th. Uh, Marty Walsh is a veteran of organized labor. He's the former head of the Boston Building and Construction Trades Council. Now, just a quick note, a lot of people have talked about how sort of progressive and and to the left that this administration has been. Generally speaking, the building and construction trades tend to be slightly more conservative than they are, than some of the others say, I don't know, public sector union. Um, so after his time there, he then became the mayor of Boston. He was a member of Labor's International Union, Union of North America. So once again, unionization and organized and collective bargaining is gonna be huge under this administration. Indeed, recently, uh, Marty Walsh mentioned that gig workers, uh, which is going to be a huge issue in this upcoming administration, should, for the most part, be considered employees. Uh, additionally, he has recently come out and said that he would like David Whale, the Obama administration's top wage regulator, who supported government crackdowns on the workforce models of Uber technologies, specifically allowing their drivers to be classified as independent contractors. Um, he would like this person to come back into the DOL to be an enforcement czar to, to some sort. Um, he would play sort of a central role in what I think is going to be the most daunting task facing the Department of Labor under the Biden administration, and that's figuring out a uh, sort of rule that uh, is sort of not necessarily placates, but is is okay with 
workers who want to remain independent contractors and workers who want the benefits of, of employment, including health care and everything that comes along with that. So to that end, he has nominated someone to be a deputy secretary of labor who has a bunch of experience uh, in that specific area uh, of, as far as the labeling of independent contractors in the gig economy. I'm sure most of the audience is here is familiar with AB, AB5, which institutes the ABC test for all independent contractors in any instance of violation of the labor code. Uh, so Deputy Secretary is going most likely going to be Julie Sue. She's already had her, her hearing. Um, she has not received a floor vote yet, but I have seen no impediment to her becoming the Deputy, Deputy Secretary of State. Um, in 2019, she was nominated and confirmed to be the head of the Labor and Workforce Development Association, which is essentially California's Department of Labor. But I think more sort of uh, relevant to this issue is going to be her time at the DLSE where she was in charge of enforcement, specifically, you know, enforcement of the ABC test, which has, has been, been very prevalent here in California. Um, Julie Sue is whip smart. Um, she's a MacArthur Genius Award winner, Harvard Law. She's known for her creative sort of targeted enforcement of certain areas. Um, the biggest criticism that she received was the oversight of the unemployment program here in California that, that did not go over very well, to say the least. Uh, but I think she's going to bring, a really, along with David Whale, if he gets into the Department of Labor as well, a very strong enforcement uh, background into hopefully what the administration would like to do is crack down on uh, the, these misclassification of independent contractors. Next slide, please. So third in line is slated to be C. Mananda. Now, Marty Walsh, the head of the DOL and the nominee for DEPSEC, both come from sort of state backgrounds. Julie Sue had a very strong uh, California background, Marty Walsh, of course, in Boston, both with very strong worker and labor ties. So into the next slide, please. Back to C. Mananda's slide, please. Oh, sorry, sorry, you can go to C. Mananda, yeah. So, uh, you know, both of those came from state, so I think that they were really looking for some federal experience, which falls squarely on Seema Nanda. Um, the most controversial aspect of her background, of course, is that she was the CEO of the DNC and has close ties to Barack Obama and this administration. Um, she was at the Department of Labor for a very long time, and she has a bunch of experience, as noted here, Chief of Staff, Deputy Solicitor, and she was also in the Civil Rights Division of the Department of Justice. And I think to that end specifically, Leon, you might have some additional comments on Seema Nanda. Sure. Uh, Seema and I were, were colleagues, actually, in the uh, Department of Justice uh, Civil Rights Division. Uh, and and uh, actually, she had joined us uh, as a staff attorney at the National, having before, just before that been a staff attorney at the National Labor Relations Board. Uh, so she comes, uh, obviously, with a wealth of substantive experience. Uh, but also really uh, unbelievable executive experience uh, going into the role that she's going to be playing. Uh, and for that reason, I think we, we can expect that, uh, and, and add to that her ties to not just uh, you know former President Obama, uh, but the Biden White House, um, former DNC Chair Tom Perez, um, I think she will be a, a quiet but important player. Uh, in what happens in this uh, in this administration. Next slide. Uh, next slide. Uh, then uh, moving uh, uh, elsewhere in the uh, Department of Labor, actually we just went past uh, Jenny Yang, uh, who is going to be uh, ha is already the director of. Uh, OFCP, OFCCP, the Office of Federal Contract uh, Compliance Programs. Uh, that's going to be a really uh, important agency uh, in part uh, because of many of the uh, racial equity issues uh, that we saw last year uh, and, and really running into this year right up to the recent uh, George Floyd trial. Uh, that's going to be one of the administration's uh, uh, really important uh, focal points uh, for uh, driving uh, racial equity issues and other uh, uh, critical uh, pay equity, sexual orientation, gender identity rights. 
Uh, she obviously was the uh, former chair of the EEOC under the Obama administration uh, and, and comes ready to, to, to take this role day one. Uh, similarly, uh, Patricia Smith on the next slide uh, is somebody who comes uh, on the next slide, um, uh, comes uh, with a depth of experience having served at, in the Obama administration as a DOL solicitor of labor. Uh, she's senior counsel uh, and, and that's important when you have uh, two uh, a secretary and deputy secretary who come from outside of Washington, from state government, uh, Patricia is going to play a really important role in, in being uh, the uh, connection uh, between the Department of Labor and, and President Biden's agenda uh, for what he would like to see the Department of Labor do. Uh, and that takes us to one person who's not in your slides. Uh, and and uh, I, I, this occurred to me just half an hour before we uh, started today, but somebody fairly critical uh, is uh, Senior White House Advisor for uh, Labor Affairs, uh, Seth Harris, who was formerly the Deputy Secretary of Labor uh, under uh, Secretary of Labor Hilda Solis in the Obama administration. Uh, he's somebody who has decades of ties uh, with the labor union. Uh, he is, has been a professor of labor management relations at Cornell University. Uh, and I'm going to I'm going to dare say here in this forum uh, that Seth, to a degree, uh, will be the shadow secretary of labor uh, and he will be driving uh, labor policy as much as anybody else in the Biden administration. Uh, and with that, I'm going to turn over to Tracy Billows, who's going to talk about the subject of the hour uh, vaccinations. Thank you, Leon. I really appreciate it. Um, in terms of the vaccination rollout, the Biden administration made a number of statements of goals and things that they hope to achieve. And one of the things um, that you will see is that um, certainly there has been great success with the goals set by the Biden administration. Over 237 million doses of the vaccine have been administered. Uh, Biden reached his goal to administer the 200 million doses in his first 100 days. Um, we have learned that Biden is going to be announcing today a new goal. He's going to be announcing a new goal of one shot being given to every adult, um, to reaching 70% of the adult population by July. Um, so it's a tremendous goal. Um, it is one that I think um, will be uh, somewhat difficult to achieve and not because of access to the vaccine, but some of the things that we are starting to see with the numbers. Um, so just quickly, you know, over 54.9% of the population 18 and older have received one of the doses. Um, and, you know, we've seen some really high doses being administered with the highest day being 4.1 uh, million in a single day. But what we are starting to see is a downward trend in the rolling seven day average. And this downward trend, um, you know, is because many of the folks who were in fact working so hard to get an appointment and get their vaccine scheduled Ultimately, we're able to do so, and now we are butting up against people who may be hesitating to get the vaccine for a variety of reasons, hesitating because of safety concerns, hesitating because they never planned to get the vaccine. Uh, but, you know, certainly many people are talking to them and trying to convince them otherwise hesitating just from sheer convenience. You know, for many people, getting the vaccine in their mind should be like getting the flu vaccine. They come into work and there's a day where, you know, they get the vaccine because their employer set up a day or two for them to sign up for appointments. Or they can walk into their local pharmacy or grocery store that has a pharmacy and they're administering the flu vaccine. So I think what we will see is that we will need to find ways, or the Biden administration, I should say, will need to find ways to make the vaccine readily accessible to get over the hump of some of that hesitancy and meet that goal. Next slide, please. In terms of the vaccination and how it's impacting workplace restrictions, the CDC did issue some guidance related to fully vaccinated individuals on two different days in April. I'm gonna talk about the April 2nd guidance first and then I'll jump into the later guidance. 
Uh, what the CDC has said with respect to the April 2nd guidance is that fully vaccinated individuals can start to visit with other fully vaccinated people indoors and they don't have to wear masks or socially distance. Um, they can visit with unvaccinated people if from a single household who are at low risk for contracting, co excuse me, for contracting COVID in a way that would have a severe impact on them. They should refrain and don't need to quarantine any longer if they have in fact been exposed to someone, if they themselves, the fully vaccinated individuals, are asymptomatic and not showing any symptoms. They can resume domestic travel and refrain from all of the testing requirements related to travel and self-quarantining. Um, and certainly there's also uh, refraining from testing before leaving the US for international travel. Now, one thing I want to point out about this guidance is this guidance is not about the workplace. Uh, you'll see there's words in here like households and you know travel and things of that sort. And yes, there's business travel that's taking place. But what the CDC made clear is that this guidance um, is not workplace guidance at this point. However, what I think all of you can take from this is this is a preview of how the CDC will be looking at issuing guidance going forward for workplaces. Um, the CDC has taken a measured approach. The CDC takes a look at the sort of data, um, how things are progressing, and then of course continues to modify its guidance accordingly. As we'll see on the next slide, that's exactly um, what the CDC did, uh, the CDC on April 27th issued some further guidance for fully vaccinated individuals, uh, opening up outdoor activities, walking, jogging, biking, dining with friends at outdoor restaurants without wearing masks, um, attending small outdoor gatherings with fully vaccinated families and friends and not having to wear a mask. Um, certainly dining at outdoor restaurants with friends from multiple households without wearing a mask. All of the things that people have been saying, when can we get back to some sort of sense of normal? We are seeing the CDC say fully vaccinated individuals can start availing themselves of many of these opportunities um, to start engaging in activities that they previously may not have been or would have been much more careful from a social distancing and mask perspective. Uh, next slide. Having said all this, though, there are still restrictions in place and even fully vaccinated individuals are still subject to restrictions. Um, the CDC has talked a lot about medium and large size gatherings, uh, you know, sporting events, parades, people, you know, where physical social distancing would be very, very difficult. Um, also, you know, some other things that they have talked about is if a uh, fully vaccinated individual is around someone who is at risk of contracting COVID and it would have a severe impact potentially on the individual. Um, fully vaccinated individuals need to be very careful um, about those interactions as well. Some other things that fully vaccinated individuals need to be mindful of. Um, if they do start experiencing COVID-19 symptoms, um, the CDC does say they need to be tested. And certainly, um, you know, want to make sure that they are following any recommendations and quarantine protocols, assuming they do ultimately test positive. In terms of what does this mean for employers? Well, it means that the employers will start to see certain uh, changes in terms of guidance from the CDC we expect with respect to workplaces. But there's a couple of things employers need to keep in mind, um, even as the Biden administration and state and local departments of public health start revising their um, guidance. First and foremost, individual employers can set reasonable safety, security, and other protocols and policies that they expect all employees to follow. And regardless of somebody's fully vaccinated status or not, an individual can be required to follow those policies and protocols. Second, even if the CDC continues down its path of uh, gradually, you know, loosening the restrictions here, especially related to fully vaccinated individuals, uh, organizations need to be mindful of state and local ordinances as well, many of which have not yet been loosened, uh, although we are starting to see more and more jurisdictions uh, do so and talk about full reopenings. But at this point, it's always my, employers should always be mindful when deciding what is appropriate or not appropriate in a workplace to not just check 
the CDC guidelines, but state and local guidelines, and of course, an employer's policies and protocols as well. And with that, I'm gonna turn this over to Scott to talk about some additional things that might impact those policies and protocols. Scott? Thanks a lot, Tracy. Uh, this is Scott Hecker, uh, to distinguish myself from my colleague, Scott Mallory. And if we go to the next slide, I'm gonna be talking about uh, initially OSHA's belated, I'll call it COVID-19 emergency temporary standard um, on, uh, I believe it was his first full day in office, President Biden issued an executive order setting a March 15th deadline for OSHA to consider whether an ETS was necessary uh, and to issue one if so. That deadline came and went uh, over a month ago as we're now in May, uh, not March. Um, so we're approaching two months late, but on Monday, April 26th, OSHA finally signaled that the delayed rule um, would be heading over to the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs at the White House. Uh, and OIRA is basically you know, a clearinghouse for, for rulemakings, helps agencies finalize their rules and get them published in the Federal Register. So we, we don't know what's in the, the ETS, but I think we can expect uh, to look to some of that CDC guidance that Tracy was just talking about and, and continue to see as it updates. In fact, uh, Secretary Walsh discussed earlier, actually put the ETS on hold for a bit to make sure that the latest science was being incorporated. So, you know, as CDC is taking that deliberate approach, um, OSHA is sort of following suit with this emergency standard. Um, OSHA also has guidance out there um, most recently uh, and, and sort of across its platforms, it points to its January 29th guidance on protecting workers uh, and mitigating the, the spread of COVID-19. You can expect some of that to, to come into play. Uh, in particular, there's a list of about 16 items that OSHA thinks uh, should be included in the most effective of COVID response plans. So a number of those could make an appearance in the ETS. And there's also state um, emergency standards out there, uh, perhaps most notably California's. Um, Virginia's was actually the first in the nation and is now a permanent standard. Um, but currently, uh, I think folks are a little nervous about the, the Cal OSHA standard making its way into the ETS, certain provisions such as the pay provisions that, that maintain benefits and pay for those who miss work um, based on COVID diagnoses or exposure. And uh, I'm sure that Secretary Biden, or excuse me, President Biden's nomination of, uh, of Cal OSHA Chief Doug Parker to be the Assistant Secretary for Federal OSHA hasn't quelled fears uh, about those kinds of provisions uh, wending their way into the federal standard. Um, there was reporting that, that the review here could take a couple of weeks. We're, we're sort of approaching that timeline, um, though there have been scheduled approximately 20 12866 meetings with OIRA over last week and this week. Um, those are meetings that allow stakeholders to meet with OIRA while uh, regulations are pending. Um, they're a bit like flying blind because no one outside the government has the text of the proposed ETS um, that, that OIRA is reviewing. But uh, nonetheless, OIRA takes into account certain concerns that folks have and, and may have even ahead of seeing the text. Um, uh, we've opined, I've opined in, in various fora that uh, the longer the ETS takes to issue, the less sense it really makes um, because it's uh, meant to protect ETSs, emergency standards under Section 6C of the OSH Act, are meant to protect employees from grave danger. Uh, and they need to be necessary to protect those employees from such danger. As we see those vaccination numbers rising, um, it's, it's maybe going to be hard for OSHA to argue that there is such an emergency protecting folks from grave danger, particularly in the workplace setting um, where you know, so many protections are already in place and vaccination is increasing as well. Um, Prior, the prior administrations, OSHA and DOL, both took the position that an ETS wasn't necessary. So OSHA will have to overcome that position to explain uh, its sort of 180 here. Um, and uh, the Biden administration's also been using the general duty clause, um, 5A1 of the OSHA Act, as did the Trump administration, but it seems to be ramping up a bit under the Biden administration, which you know potentially confirms the assumption that um, the tools that were needed were already available and that this ETS is, is somewhat superfluous. Uh, the other 
issue that we may have is, is sort of how states will need to comply. Um, those who follow federal OSHA will obviously be covered by the ETS, but other states, including Texas and Florida, who, Florida, who are some of the states leading the charge in, in rolling back um, you know, mitigation protocols addressing COVID, uh, they, they are covered as, um, as under OSHA. So it'll be interesting to see how they address uh, a potential ETS. And uh, other states that are state plans will need to implement ETS, ETSs that are at least as effective as OSHAs. That's the standard for state plans. So uh, we'll see how it goes. Um, when it comes to the vaccine cost, uh, context that, that Tracy was discussing, OSHA typically historically has not mandated employee vaccinations, but has indicated that employers can. Um, I don't think we're going to see a mandate in an ETS, um, but it could implicate whistleblower protections. Um, you know, dealing with vaccinations, employer vaccinations, and um, it could also implicate 5A1 if employees say, hey, you don't have a vaccination program, you're not providing a safe workplace. So uh, lots of issues to think about as we move forward with that. If we could go to the next slide. In the meantime, while we wait for the ETS to issue on March 12th, OSHA did institute a COVID-19 National Emphasis Program, uh, meaning that they are targeting particular industries listed there in our uh, accent color um, that will um, the OSHA will focus on to try and prevent uh, the spread of COVID and to um, issue citations in, in these industries. Interestingly, these are some of the industries that probably have the higher uh, sector vaccination rates, um, so really should have lower risks in the workplace. So there's there's some confusing or circular argument there, um, but we will certainly continue to see uh, citations issued under you know respiratory protection, reporting and record keeping, uh, personal protective equipment standards, as well as the, the reference general duty clause. Um, at this point, you're also seeing a lot of um, challenges to COVID-19 citations at a higher rate. Um, there's a report suggesting about five times the rate of normal citation challenges. And I think that's probably because uh, employers have reputational concerns um, about not addressing COVID um, and, and sort of being labeled as, as an employer who didn't deal with COVID. Um, there may be an impact on civil potential civil actions uh, and also you know, a lot of employers have been taking a lot of actions for a long time to mitigate risk in the workplace. So, um, you know, many believe that they've done the right thing. They followed CDC or state guidance or rules. Um, they put in place the risk mitigation protocols that are required or recommended and uh, believe that the programs are working. So that's another reason to challenge um, any COVID citations that issue. You'll also see at the bottom of the slide there that the National Emphasis Program has a uh, focus on whistleblower uh, and retaliation. Um, so that's another uh, another area to take a look at and be aware of uh, if you find yourself uh, dealing with an OSHA COVID-19 investigation. Uh, if we go to the next slide, just addressing some of the uh, down ballot folks uh, in, in the OSHA leadership. We do have Doug Parker as the nominee to be the Assistant Secretary. Uh, in place already are folks like uh, Jim Frederick, who uh, has about three decades of experience, uh, including 25 at um, 25 with the United Steelworkers. Uh, Mandy Edens has been with the department for a long time, with OSHA for a long time in various roles. Chip Hughes, another union person um, who has experience in responding to uh, to emergencies and, and sort of brought in, I think, to, to address, you know, be part of the leadership team on COVID. Leah Ford, chief of staff, has been someone who's negotiated and provided advice uh, on behalf of unions and collective bargaining associations, uh, or excuse me, agreements, and, um, you know, uh, across a number of industries uh, worked with unions. And Ann Rosenthal is actually my former boss when I was in the OSH division at the uh, solicitor's office at the, at the Department of Labor. Um, so she was the associate solicitor for occupational safety and health and now is in a senior advisor role. Um, so she's had sort of an enforcement and policy position within uh, DOL for, for an extended period and is brought back after retiring from the solicitor's office to be a senior advisor directly to OSHA. Um, if we could go to the next slide. 
And for those of you who are huge fans of our webinars, um, you've likely seen this slide before as I've talked about publicity and that David Michaels quote, um, every OSHA press release achieves as much compliance as 210 inspections. Um, so we've already seen OSHA go back to releasing press releases uh, that concern violations issued as opposed to um, violations upheld or penalties paid. Um, so it's a bit of uh, the public shaming aspect of publicity that we've been seeing there. Um, when it comes to activity in the first 100 days on, uh, you know, beyond the ETS, what else we might see uh, from OSHA? There's been actually congressional action um, in the healthcare space, healthcare violence, workplace violence protection um, space. The House is, has passed a, a resolution requiring OSHA to issue a rule um, to implement workplace violence prevention plans in healthcare and social service. Um, unclear whether the Senate will do anything with that, but that's an area that OSHA has been interested in for a while, so they could engage in rulemaking on that front. Uh, heat stress is another hot area. Oh, sorry, that was an unintentional and bad pun, but it's another area uh, that is uh, a focus of OSHA. Um, and there was uh, a heat stress bill referred to the House Committee on Education and Labor at the end of March. And in mid-April, a similar bill was introduced in the Senate and referred to the Committee on Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions. So there may be additional activity there on the OSHA front. We haven't seen it yet, but that could be where things are going moving forward. Record keeping and reporting are also uh, something that's kind of ping-ponged back and forth between the Obama and Trump administrations, so we could see Biden, uh, Biden administration take another take another swing at it. Um, but that's it for me for now, and I think I'm kicking it back to Scott Mallory for discussion of infrastructure. Hello, everyone. Again, uh, you can go ahead and go to the next slide, Kate. Uh, so you know, so far we haven't talked a ton about legislation. Uh, which all, we know that, that he, passed, he passed, the Congress and eventually signed by the president that $1.9 trillion American rescue plan. And we heard earlier about, you know, the vaccine rollout and how that's been so sort of successful. Well, part of the reason that was so successful was the legislative drive behind the American rescue plan that afforded a bunch of money to that. So what is Biden planning on doing? Well, He's now, now we're going to move a little bit into the theoretical, but Joe Biden is planning on building on that American Rescue Plan through legislation that has quite the hefty bill on top of that $1.9 trillion. So why I say that we're moving a little bit into the theoretical is because, a, as Scott mentioned about the ETS, we haven't seen the statutory language of any sort of American jobs plan or the American Families Plan that was introduced last week. Um, but the big thing is that this is going to supposedly de expand the definition of infrastructure. So of course, the you know the, the proposal would fix highways, rebuild bridges, upgrade ports, airports, and transit systems, which is kind of considered traditional infrastructure, I guess you would say. Uh, I think interestingly, Senator Chris Coons has uh, has basically proposed legislative strategy in which sort of there's a bill that would fix highways, rebuild bridges, upgrade ports that they were hoping to get some bipartisan consensus on and pass that. And then they would move into this sort of delivering clean drinking water, renewed electrical grid, high-speed broadband, upgrading residential homes. Specifically, he would like to get all the lead pipes out of there, uh, increase wages for caregivers. That's all stuff that they're probably not going to be able to get any Republican support for. So it's going to have to be passed through reconciliation. Um, he has talked about investing in workforce development and incentivizing corporations to stay here in, in, in America. Now, I'm going to throw out some pretty big numbers right now, but please just know that these numbers are subject to being changed uh, because they haven't had any statutory language yet. And as you know, negotiations between Democrats, Republicans, and the administration are ongoing. So, uh, of course, fixing and rebuilding bridges, upgrading ports, that's going to be expensive. Delivering clean drinking water, he's proposed allocating $111 billion to that, which would replace all of the nation's lead pipe, $56 billion in grants to low-cost flexible loans to tribes and territories, 
uh, build high-speed broadband infrastructure to reach 100% coverage. That includes rural areas. Now, I'll just note real quick that this sort of rural areas, uh, low-cost loans to states, tribes, and territories is sort of reflective of the overall mission of really getting this legislation to impact those underserved, low-served, low-income communities, such as rural communities and minority populations. Um, Another controversial aspect of this bill would be the huge upgrade to residential homes, $213 billion to retrofit those homes, $40 billion to improve infrastructure of public housing, which of course is controversial, $100 billion to upgrade and build new schools, $18 billion for Veteran Affairs Hospital, $400 billion for increased wages for caregivers. Now, this is of course extremely controversial, uh, but I think that the argument the administration is going to make is that, hey, this money might be a lot right now, but at the end of the day, it's going to help the economy by allowing, you know, parents to not have to worry about child care when they're out contributing to the economy. So goes the argument. Um, and then this whole invest in workforce development situation is basically currently allocated for $100 billion and already proven uh, workforce development programs. Now, again, these are mostly going to be in sort of these under undeserved uh, sort of uh, poor, low-income communities. Uh, that's sort of the American job plan in a very, very short, quick nutshell. Now, if you go to the next slide, please. The million-dollar question, of course, is how to pay for it. Now, it's funny that I put the million-dollar question on this slide when it should really be like the five trillion-dollar question, right? That's that's really what we're looking at here. I, the first thing is, is he's going to try to do what he can to get rid of that 2017 uh, Donald Trump era tax cut that really cut the corporate tax rate in half. So he wants to set that back up, discourage off the the plan would discourage offshore sort of uh, tax credits that some companies get and try to incentivize them to make everything back in America. Uh, a 15% minimum tax on income operations that used to report their profits to investors. This is known as book income. This is probably a little pedantic for some people, but you know, in the campaign trail, it would have applied to a lot more companies. But in this plan, it's been much more narrowed, so it really only applied to about 45 companies right now. So uh, they would eliminate tax references for fossil fuels, which is reflective of the administration's sort of priority to uh, up uh, climate change legislation, and then also a bunch of money for IRS code enforcement. Like, say, for example, a company is not classifying its workers correctly as employees and instead as independent contractors. Well, independent contractors, uh, they don't, the, the employer doesn't have to pay as much tax, say, sort of employment taxes for them. So the, this bill would, or this proposal would ramp up money for that specific kind of enforcement to ensure all the employers are paying their fair taxes. Next slide, please. Now, this is the big thing, and Leanne mentioned this right at the very beginning of this webinar, right? Everything that is, it, that is proposed really has this sort of racial equity and union sort of hue to it. Uh, for example, and we noted that there's no statutory language currently, there's, but there is a detailed fact sheet. That fact sheet mentions unions 24 times. Everything is imbued, right, with this labor and workforce development, and everything is, is, is intended to make it easier for workers to collectively bargain, right? So the plan demands that employers benefiting from these investments follow these strong labor standards and remain neutral when their employees seek to organize a union and bargain collectively. Um, this is this is sort of in line with the executive order that he recently issued, the president, I should say, uh, establishing a $15 minimum wage for all federal contractors. So we're going to have this legislation is supposed to allocate all this money for all these federal contracts. Well, part of the way that they're going to get that $15 minimum wage in is through that executive order, right? So because it couldn't go through the American Rescue Plan through reconciliation. So, uh, yeah, and then at the same time, when he announced this jobs plan, he's also recently signed an executive order establishing a pro-union tax force to be headed by Kamala Harris, right? The vice chair will be Marty Walsh. So, I don't think that this is a situation in which they're, I don't know, quote, unquote, messing around. They really are going to 
seek to find existing labor laws that they can use to make it easier for workers to collectively bargain. Now, this is just a little bit of parlor game here, but you know, I see his creation of this tax force as almost an admission of defeat on the PRO Act. Right? Despite the fact that last week he, during his joint session to Congress, outwardly said, please pass the PRO Act. Well, they would need 10 members of Congress to pass most of the provisions that are currently in the Pressing Right to Organize Act. So what do you do? The president establishes this tax force to see what kind of existing labor laws can be used to increase unionization and collective bargaining. Next slide, please. Okay, this is the big one that he introduced uh, last week in the joint session of Congress. Again, we have no statutory language. This would again be a tr multiple tr trillion dollar plan. Again, I think the argument is gonna be that this is a big, huge investment now that will be good for the economy later by allowing parents to contribute to the economy while their children or uh, family members are at work. So really there are three buckets, childcare, big one, uh, 12 weeks of paid family leave, and reforming the unemployment insurance system. So that third one I wanna talk about a bit. Can we go to the next slide, please, Kate? So you know, this slide and the next slide, I think kind of speak for themselves. Um, it, it, this is basically what, what the proposal lays out. Uh, again, this is seeking to save money for families so that they can contribute to the economy. So the argument would go. So I think these slides we them. So let's go to the next slide. Kate, next slide. Okay, unemployment insurance reform. Now, I think this is a big one as well. Now, one thing that it would do first and foremost is it would extend the length that people can get unemployment insurance and it would bump up the number. Um, the proposal as it's currently constituted is of course very light on the details. But we can clean some of the details that are going to be in the bill by looking at this uh, sort of discussion draft bill that was introduced by Senator Ron Wyden. Now, I read the bill and I think that the most sort of problematic uh, language in that bill that might get pulled over into the American Families Plan would be an ABC type test for all states and their unemployment insurance system. So, as some of you may know, uh, Independent contractors, typically now there are some provisions from the CARES Act that, that change this a little bit, but independent contractors typically also can get unemployment insurance. What this bill would do was, is it would require all states to implement an ABC type test, which uh, for our audience is an extremely stringent independent contractor classification test. Almost everybody ends up being an employee under the test, unfortunately. So what this bill would do is it would force the unemployment, sort of unemployment departments in each state to determine whether or not someone's an independent contractor using the ABC test. So that would be something that, that, that employers should be concerned about. Now there are some, they have talked about sort of these added uh, incentives, adding the length and adding the amount and even the ABC test not affecting uh, an employer's experience rating. However, uh, you know, this again is theoretical, so that could could definitely change. Um, again, the, the paying for it is obviously the most difficult part. Uh, corporation taxes are gonna go up. Individual taxes are should not go up unless you make more than 400,000 a year individually. So hopefully that sticks, we'll see what happens. And on to that, and I'm very excited to turn it over to my former podcasting colleague and our great labor relations expert, Kylan Kershaw. Thank you, Scott. So just gonna go over, obviously, I think we've already beat you guys over the head with the fact that the Biden administration is, is pro-union and has adopted <laughs> some pro-union policies. So I don't think that's a shock to anybody. I uh, just wanted to go over um, just a couple specifics. I don't think there are a lot of surprises here. Um, as you guys know, the NLRB is the agency with primary responsibility for this area. Uh, this is not, you know, it's normal for the NLRB to interpret the law differently depending on who controls the administration. Um, and it's, it's common for the NLRB to interpret the law, you know, in favor of unions um, when it's controlled by Democratic presidential appointees. 
On that note, the general counsel's office, because Biden fired Peter Robb and the acting general counsel, Peter Orr, is his, you know, is a, is a well-known Democrat and pro-labor um, member of the agency. The general counsel's office is already essentially under uh, Biden's control, but the actual board itself won't become democratically controlled until the end of August um, when Bill Emanuel's term expires. And when that happens is when you'll really see law change at the board level, as opposed to just the enforcement level in the general counsel's office. And, you know, some of the things that we, I'd be willing to guarantee we will see um, workplace policies. I, I know everyone so enjoyed the last few years of, of being able to have civility rules and, and not, you know, lose sleep at, over what's in their handbook. I, I would respectfully submit that those days are over. I can say anecdotally that the region is back to trying to get handbooks, the full handbook, no matter what the charge is, no matter what the context. Um, we obviously can give advice if that ever happens to you, but they're doing that because they're planning on looking at the rules for potential violations. Um, so that's something that we would expect to come back. Uh, likewise, I think there's going to be a lot more tolerance for what we would normally consider to be misconduct um, from employees if they're in the midst of any sort of union organizing or protected activity. Uh, there was the General Motors decision, which was a you know breath of fresh air for employers, and that it, it sort of established you know limits around what employees can and can't do in the context of protected activity. Um, I expect that we'll see that overturned or pulled back significantly. Um, similar to sort of what we saw under the Obama administration with Penn Plaza and some of those decisions that allowed pretty egregious outbursts from employees as long as they were in the context of protected activity. Uh, one thing I wanted to highlight, which was actually brought up in a recent um, general counsel memo, uh, is that the general counsel's office seems very intent on extending section seven protection to political issues and social justice causes. And to the point where, you know, causes that I think have previously been sort of without question considered outside of the purview of the NLRB um, are the general counsel is at least taking the position that they're considered protected activity under federal labor laws. Um, I can give a few examples. Um, I have a case right now where, you know, an employee wore a Black Lives Matter mask and in a context that didn't relate to any other coworkers, wasn't related to working conditions is not the sort of thing that you would typically see. Um, it, it's the kind of charge that a couple of years ago would have just gotten dismissed. And instead, because of the general counsel's memo, it's likely to go straight to advice. And so the division of advice is really pushing on expanding these issues. And so I say that just as kind of a caution to everybody that this seems to be something they're really trying to push through. So when you're looking at limiting masks, issuing discipline for these types of activities, um, it's something worth taking a second look at before you take any actual action. Um, as a point of comfort, I would note there's a Supreme Court decision, the East X decision that is still very much in play. And I would argue that the general counsel's memo um, pushes the bounds of that. And even if the board does try and extend section seven protections to political causes or things that clearly are not work related, um, there is Supreme Court precedent that requires there to be some nexus to terms and conditions of employment. So. We'll kind of see how that plays out. Um, and then, you know, just another point, just to mention some of the Obama era rules that made it a lot easier for unions to organize were trimmed back during the Trump administration, uh, the election rules, a lot of decisions like specialty health care. Um, regardless of whether or not the PRO Act passes, I would expect the pendulum to swing back to at least what we saw under the Obama board, if not farther. I mean, you know, as far as the pro act goes, I feel like we've covered that a little bit, but you know, it's it's their grand wish list. It's literally everything and anything organized labor has ever wanted in a single piece of legislation. It's passed the house twice um, in its current form. You know, Joe Manchin, and I know this caused some, you know, concern for some of our clients. Understandably, came out and said that he would support the pro act. Uh, but what I would note there is that he he didn't say that he would overturn the filibuster and. Cinema, uh, Kelly and Warner, last I checked, still have not signed on to this. There's virtually no chance of Republican support. So, you know, still not a reason for panic at this point. Um, that said, I think pieces of the law um, 
will make it through, you know, administratively through case law or what have you, but, you know, that could be an a topic for an entire webinar, but a lot of the more radical changes in the PRO Act would have to get through legislatively to be legal or lawful, so it'll be held up in court. Uh, next slide, please. So with all this going on, you know, things, you know, it's nothing surprising, but we recommend that anybody that anticipates or is vulnerable to union organizing to make sure that you're actively monitoring your employee relations, keeping an eye on where you might be vulnerable to, to organizing. Do you know who your supervisors are? Do you know what your potential bargaining units are? You know, just making sure that you're dealing with you know, employee issues, including some of the social justice and political issues that we talked about briefly earlier, um, because those are in COVID-19, there are a lot of different and unusual topics that are driving organizing right now. And so just making sure that, you know, you're keeping an eye on those, because I think at some point the deck will be stacked against employers when it comes to trying to campaign against unions. Um, along those lines too, if you're bargaining a contract right now, I would, you know, it's not easy to do. I'm not meaning to make it sound simple, but uh, encouraging any and every employer that can negotiate the specific rights and their management rights clause um, so that they are maximizing their ability to act without bargaining. Um, because I think in order to actually make an argument that the unions waive their right to bargain over something with this administration, you're going to have to have pretty ironclad and express language. Um, and then, you know, obviously we've talked about this, but just greater caution in terms of responding to employee activity, keeping in mind the lens that it's going to be viewed through by the current administration. And then, you know, on the legislative front, the EPPRA, so we've, you know, made pretty big changes in terms of, you know, past monetary relief that's gone through to underfunded multi-employer pension plans. Um, and then, you know, keeping tabs on the PRO Act, but again, no specific reason on that yet to to believe that it is actually going to get through. Um, and then next slide, I want to make sure we get to immigration. So I'll talk about the past year, you know, different types of protected activity. There's obviously the obvious ones complaining about managers, wages, work rules, hours, benefits, anything along those lines. Again, it may not matter that the complaints are heated or potentially even if an employee swears, yells, um, that that may not necessarily remove the conduct from the protection of the actor, that that's the position this board is likely to take. Um, again, writing negative things about a manager or an employer on social media, um, talking about a union at work, um, you know, we'll see how it plays out, but, you know, in certain situations, even during working time, that can be acceptable. So just something to keep an eye, up, an eye on, and we're obviously happy to answer any specific questions about that. Um, and then, you know, obviously, the next slide, I'm sorry, sharing employee pay or you know concerns wearing a union badge I, I don't think that comes as a surprise to anybody um one that's come up i have to say with increasing regularity for me as employees walking off the job um even during working hours to protect you know protest pay or rules or benefits and again you know if it's work related employees don't have to seek advanced permission it includes things like joining a fight for 15 rally a workplace safety rally um, really, the, the question for that is, is there an argument that it's work-related? And that's something we'd be happy to walk anybody through on a case-to-case -case basis, case-by-case -case basis. And then, you know, the last slide, just sort of how to respond to these things. Um, I always tell people when you're facing these kinds of actions, particularly if a union is involved and you know that, um, to assume that they're doing it to get you to respond in some way that's going to give them the ability to file an unfair labor practice charge. And so it's it's almost like, you know, a bully or something to that extent, you don't want to give them what they want. And so, you know, you want to try and stay calm, not overreact to the situation because that tends to just make it get worse, tends to make them come back. Um, ultimately, what they're seeking is attention and just keeping that in mind. Um, and then, you know, a lot of times we get questions about when police can and can't be called. Um, you know, obviously that's a case by case situation. If people are engaging in unlawful activity, if they're blocking customer entrances or exits, you know, there are different th times when that action can be appropriate. Um, but that wouldn't be my first reaction um, and, and certainly not without thinking about it. And then, you know, obviously suspicious incidents, um, you know, that that's a piece, but, but I also think um, even though we need to kind of track incidents, just making sure that you're not doing so in a way that gives the impression that you're 
trying to survey union activity. Um, and then again, you know, probably the biggest piece over all of this is uh, we still want you to be able to discipline employees when it's necessary and when it's appropriate. But if, if the activity is potentially protected, I would caution your managers, um, you know, not to actually take that disciplinary action without conferring with HR or legal or whomever it may be um, to make sure that they're on solid ground or have at least, you know, appropriately assessed the risk before doing so. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Leon. Great. Well, just as important as immigration is the CLE code, and that is SS, uh, S as in Seifarth, S as in Seifarth, 3992. Once again, S as in Seifarth, S as in Seifarth, 3992. Uh, real quick about immigration. Uh, first, key thing, uh, COVID, uh, just like we were just talking about in the rest of labor and employment, uh, COVID is very much governing what's happening uh, in immigration right now. Uh, while the work visa-based travel bans expired at the end of March, regional travel bans continue in effect and were extended, very important for uh, this audience today, extended to add uh, India. Uh, where COVID uh, transmission rates have gone through the roof uh, and the government and the healthcare system's ability to manage the pandemic seems to have collapsed uh, completely. Uh, that suggests that these kind of regional travel bans are going to be around for a while. Um, what it also means is once recovery begins and we start digging out of these bans, the backlogs and the consulates and embassies worldwide uh, but particularly in the countries affected directly by these bans uh, are going to be severe. And so the travel system will probably not recover from this uh, in reality for a couple of years after uh, the expiration of these travel bans. Next slide. Um, another issue that's really gonna be governing what's happening is the operational health of the two uh, critical immigration agencies. One is my former agency, US Citizenship and Immigration Services, uh, was experiencing severe operating deficits last summer, summer threatening a potential 60% furlough of its workforce as of last August. Um, while we await new leadership, uh, it is not clear yet what the plan is to dig out of what have become severe backlogs. I already mentioned the State Department backlogs. Uh, that will take us to the next slide where we talk about uh, one final COVID-related impact. This one could turn out to be a positive one, uh, and that is uh, over the last 14 months, a number of you have been able to take advantage of the remote flexibility for I-9 verification. Uh, this has um, uh, an experiment that I think is going to prove that uh, this can be done and it can be done in a way that preserves the integrity of the work authorization system. Uh, sure, among, uh, among other organizations, has placed I-9 reform as one of its strategic pillars. Uh, and as a result of this, we might see permanent permission for remote I-9 preparation, uh, possibly consolidation of I-9 and E-Verify, and other reforms to really bring the I-9 system to, to more of a, uh, a reasonable, uh, employer-friendly uh, system while at the same time safeguarding the integrity of the work authorization system. Uh, on the specific topic of sponsored immigration, taking us over the next slide, um, you see a lot of emphasis on uh, reversing uh, Trump era policies and practices along the lines of everything else we just heard over the last half hour or so. Um, but this has been particularly focused on uh, attacking a number of rules uh, that were issued in the last year of the Trump administration, uh, the public charge regulation, which really affected all immigration of all types, um, um, was challenged in court. Uh, rather than continue to fight um, the challenge in court, the uh, uh, Biden administration simply rescinded uh, that regulation. A number of uh, regulations that would have affected uh, the um, uh, H-1B visa system, particularly surrounding the prevailing wage structure, uh, have been delayed. Um, one that would have uh, re, uh, reorganized the, the registration system has been delayed until the end of this year, so it could potentially be effective for fiscal 2022. 
uh, and a prevailing wage regulation, which would have raised the overall prevailing wage rates, uh, has been delayed into the middle of 2022 with additional comment uh, being collected on those uh, areas. But big headline here is actually that uh, immigration, workplace immigration has thus far appeared to be a low priority uh, for the Biden administration. While it has rolled back certain um, um, not well received Trump era policies, uh, there's really no sign uh, that the administration is going to be really moving forward anytime soon, uh, really because of two things. Uh, one is the border, uh, uh, which is very much driving the attention of pretty much every uh, immigration agency. Uh, but two is the longstanding issue of the undocumented, particularly the dreamer population and the future of the DACA program. Those are going to continue to be the primary focus when it comes to immigration of the Biden administration. And with that, we are just slightly over the top of the hour. So this becomes my time to thank my always impressive co-panelists, uh, to thank the 300 plus uh, of you all who have joined us this afternoon, and to say we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you and have a wonderful afternoon.